Uh, welcome to Trondheim. I have to look at the camera for Trondheim, <laughs> yes, and, and uh, Oslo. Um, about a year ago, I was in San Francisco, and uh, after following Pamela's work uh, for some years, there's still a little bit of feedback here. If you could turn me a little bit more down. I think it's okay. Ah, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, so I knew I was going to meet her, uh, and uh, before I went, I asked uh, my colleagues at the different music technology educations if they would be join me in inviting her to Norway. And then I met her, a bit starstruck, but still, I managed to ask her if she was interested, and she's she's she came. She's she arrived yesterday, and she will be here for nine days. She will do this talk today. She will also be at the Volume Mute, Volume Mute, uh, Trondheim uh, uh, on uh, Monday, and she's doing concerts in Trondheim, an installation in Trondheim, concerts here in Oslo next week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So you will you really show us a lot in these nine days. You have a busy program. So today, Pamela, you will show us your instruments and tools. That's the main subject for today. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so I'm in the system, yeah? Oh, no, it's this one. You want to do this one for now. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, so I, I thought I would do a combination of things today. I thought I would um, do a little bit, uh, I'll talk to you about my work and about the tools that I use, but I think maybe the, the best way to start is by uh, doing a little bit of live performance so that you can actually see what uh, what I'm using and, and you know what all of this is about. And then I'll, I'll maybe give you a little history about how I sort of came to be using this particular set of tools and and we'll go from there and uh, um, and I want to make sure to leave some time at the end for anybody who has questions as well. Um, but I'll start with just a little bit of uh, performance for you. Oh, <laughs> 
make sure that they can hear me over there. Um, so uh, what I just did now uh, was kind of a, a, a little sort of live improvised mashup of several existing pieces that I have. And I just tried to squeeze little bits of different things all together so that I could, so that you could see me using all these different instruments in the same sort of five minute or whatever it was <laughs> segment. Um, uh, so ordinarily when I perform those pieces there, each one of them is sort of a separate something, but I kind of mushed them together just so that I could give you a little quick demo of many of the tools that I'm using in live performance. Um, so I, I think I'll just, I'll talk a little bit about. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, ah, right here. Okay. So. I should have probably been further back. You just pick up right where you left <laughs> off. It's as if you never stopped you talking. Be quiet. Hi, Tron time. <laughs> I'll do this. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about my um, just sort of the the basics of what I use in any given performance, um, which is probably the heart of all of it is the combination of my voice and the processing that I do on my voice in real time. And most of the processing is based on digital delay. So uh, there's a lot of live sampling of what I'm doing. And then I capture those things and create layers with them um, and sometimes process those those. Uh, those samples that I've captured or process the real, the voice in real time as it's happening. And the processing is, uh, like I said, it's mostly, it's a lot of it is digital delay. And also I'm using some uh, granular synthesis. Um, there's a, a type of uh, granulation that I like to use that I can get through um, a, a plugin that I got from GRM. Um, that's called uh, GRM Tools, and they have several tools in there. But one that there's a couple that I use a lot. One of them is called Shuffling, and that gives me all of that granulation that I can change the size of the grains. I can change the randomness. I can change the whether there's pitch shifting on it, and so on and so forth. And then there's another one in there that they have called Freeze that allows me to grab samples and granulate them, but also like stop in a very particular part of the sample and move back and forth, rock back and forth through the length of the sample to find different parts of it that I can play with. Um, so the so the processing on my voice these days is all happening in this computer here uh, through Max MSP. And how many people know Max MSP here? And there? <laughs> <laughs> so kind of half of you, or a little more than half of you. Um, so for those who are not so familiar, it's it's kind of a programming environment that you it's object oriented. So you're placing little objects on the on the screen. It, it's if you start out like you know, like if a writer were to say they wanted to write a novel and they open up Microsoft Word. 
they might be disappointed to find just this blank white page. And it's actually them that has to put words in there <laughs> to make a novel appear. And uh, Max MSP is kind of the same way. Um, you can't, you don't just open it up and automatically have things that work. You have to put things onto this blank page and connect them with little patch cables. But um, the, the Max patch that I use for my um, performance is something that I've been sort of developing since the late 90s. Um, just to give you a little history, when I first started doing this kind of work with my voice and live processing, I was um, using hardware only. And so the hardware that I was using was a, a, a rack full of digital delay units, like rack mountable digital delay units and multi-effects processor and a sampler. And so these are all like black boxes, you know, the, those long 19 inch wide uh, rack mountable black boxes. And I started out with just one and it was my, my very first processor was a digital delay um, made by Ibanez and um, it, it was, it, I bought it in the early, like pro early to mid eighties, actually. So I started working with voice and live processing in 1980, I would say 82 or 83. Um, and at that time, there were no laptops and people who did computer music were doing it at institutions and universities because the computers were these gigantic you know, monstrosities that you, um, now, is it just my imagination or did the sound drop out? Hello? You all still hear me? Yes. Oh, you do? That's weird. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Um, so what I started to say is, uh, uh, yeah, so people who were using computers back when I first started doing uh, processing on my voice were generally not carrying them around to gigs. Um, and, uh, so I was just using this hardware bought from a music store. Um, it sort of started because I was, I was trying to figure out a way to, to do something more adventurous, more experimental with my music. And I saw someone in a concert perform, with a uh, perform like a bass solo with a digital delay. And I had never seen one. Most people had never seen one at this point. This, we're talking like this was probably 1980 like I said, 82 or 83. And um, I went to the uh, music store the very next day and I was like, there's a guy and he had this thing and he did this and then it just came back and it happened. And the music guy in the music store said, that's a digital delay. And I said, I'll take one. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, and then he said, but you don't want what that guy had because the, this guy was, uh, the guy who I saw using it was, um, He's the, uh, the late um, Jaco Pastorius, who was the bass player for a band called Weather Report back in those days. And uh, at that point in the concert, the whole band just sort of vacated the stage and they left him alone on the stage and he sat there and played this solo, with, uh, duetting with himself. And um, so the guy in the music store explained to me, well, what he was using was a stomp box, which is these little, you know, these little guitar processors that um, <clears throat> they have... Uh, very, very low sampling rate. And he said, it's not going to sound very good on your voice. So he sold me instead a, a much higher end um, device that was made by Ibanez. And it was a 19 inch wide rack mountable digital delay. But in those days, the memory was so expensive that um, this delay that I bought had like one second <laughs> of delay. So um, I, I took this home and I started playing with it and I began to realize immediately that if you turn up the feedback control on it, you can actually get layers that sound a lot longer than one second long. Um, and so I just, I just was immediately immersed in this idea of layering and, and building textures and, and rhythms and things from pieces of my voice. Um, and I, I would say that it was that moment that I, my whole artistic uh, output kind of changed. My, I, I sort of feel like I found my voice as an artist when I started playing with processing. And even though I had this one delay, which is one second, um, and of course I immediately had to go out and start buying more of them. And in, within the next few years, uh, 
there was this very, very quick change in how memory, because all everybody was getting into computers and memory was getting cheaper. Each year was getting much cheaper. Um, so like I was able to go out and buy another one. So I started out with one that was one second delay. Then I bought another one that was four seconds. And then I bought another one that was eight seconds. And in the span of maybe a year or two, those uh, things went from being, you know, hundreds of dollars for one second of delay to about the same price for eight seconds of delay. And then I could send off to a company and buy a memory chip that I could put into one of my delays to bring it up to like 32 seconds of delay. And I was like in heaven with all of this delay time. <laughs> so I was really playing mostly at that time with just delay. And, um, but I think the most obvious way that people use digital delay is with this sort of looping thing where you grab a sample, like you heard me do a little bit of that, grab a sample and it loops and then you create something that's rhythmic, you build harmonies on top of that, and then you can sing a melody over the top of that. And, and um, that's now pretty rampant. I mean, ev everyone is doing that now. But at that time, nobody was doing it. And so it was very interesting to me. But also what became more interesting to me was as I got more delays, I began to learn about out of phase loops and, and and also making loops that are so long that they no longer sound like looping. It sounds more like textures and timbres that are gradually changing. And, and so I was playing with that a lot. But um, in my first several years of, of working with electronics, it was mainly just this live um, uh, digital delay that I was using. Plus, you know, I was using a lot of reverb. I had a multi-effects, I had this boss multi-effects multi uh it was like half rack, rack space uh, piece that had all kinds of, um, had reverb and it had like pitch shifting and a few other multi-tap delay things and some presets that, and then you could build your own. And so those were the things I was mainly using. Um, and uh, then I would say like in the, the, I continue using these all through in, through the, through the 90s. Um, in the early 90s, I introduced um, ge gesture control to what I was doing. And I was going to show you a video, but I decided it was, it, was, it was just all that we had time for to get the sound working right. So I, I'm not going to show you any video, but I'll just describe that um, my first gesture control instrument was a wearable thing. But it wasn't any of the ones that you see here. It was an instrument called the body synth which was a really dumb name because um, the instrument was not a synthesizer. So the, so the synth was kind of a misnomer, but the guys who invented it called it the body synth. Um, and I think they just called it that because I think everybody in those days just thought that electronic music and synthesizers are just synonymous. So it's body synth. Um, it was actually a MIDI controller. It was not a synth synthesizer in any way, shape or form. It did not generate any tone. Um, but it, uh, was a gesture controller that allowed me to use physical gestures to control sound. And I apologize, Trondheim, because I keep looking at the, the humans, the live people in the room, and I forget you're, uh, you're just this little eye right there. Um, so, uh, so this instrument involved uh, electrode sensors, and this is this is just a medical technology. It's exactly what you would find in the hospital when they take your EKG or your EEG or whatever. It's little um, sensors that you, these electrodes, and, and you would actually attach them to your skin, um, to your muscles. And it was measuring the amount of electricity being generated by your muscles. So you were basically sending MIDI messages by the amount of effort. You're basically making numbers. So the amount of effort from the muscle would generate numbers. And then that would go to a little CPU that would turn, the, turn those numbers into MIDI messages. Um, and then you had to program that for each piece to say, like, what, what do these numbers mean in this piece? You know? And so sometimes they would be note numbers, and I could make notes, um, which meant that I could trigger sample sounds or, you know, actual pitches or a banks of samples that were mapped out on, uh, a, a, on a MIDI keyboard. Um, or I could send a pitch bend message or so that maybe in this hand I could trigger a, a note and in this hand I could bend the pitch of that note. So each, um, each piece and each section of each piece, I had to program presets to make decisions about what was being controlled. And in, with that instrument, I had four different sensors 
I was wearing one on each arm. I was wearing one on my shoulder. I was wearing one on my leg. And then I could, with uh, any use of those different muscles, I could uh, make, I could send numbers and, and control things. And um, <laughs> there's actually kind of a funny story with that instrument because basically most of these instruments that use sensors they're really biofeedback devices. It's just, uh, you know, and as a matter of fact, it's the origin of that one is that it was actually intended to be used for medical purposes. And if you've ever seen in somebody uh, who's gone to the hospital for some problem with their heart or something, and you see they take these little metal snaps that have a little Band-Aid attached, and they just kind of like attach it to the person's chest, and they have to put a little bit of gel on there so that they make contact, the electrical current will pass from the person's body into this contact. So I had to do that. I had a little, a little tube of gel and I put a little gel on and I would attach them to each muscle that I wanted to use. And then I had cables that were running through my clothes and into like a little sort of box that I wore at my waist, like right here. And um, when I first started playing that instrument, what I found was happening was I, I, I well, in my studio, I thought I was just becoming a virtuoso on it. I was like, oh, I'm so great. I can trigger samples. And I had organized this piece where I had, I was triggering samples with, with one hand and then I was using the other hand to like change the panning so that I could be in this room with a quad system and I could whip the sound around the audience's heads by doing this with my arm. And I, I had all these different things figured out and it was working beautifully and I got in front of the audience and then it just started triggering like mad. And I was like, why is it triggering? I'm not doing it. And I figured out that, you know, it's, it's definitely a biofeedback device and it's picking up the electricity from your muscles. So if you get in front of an audience, your adrenaline level bumps everything up. And so all of a sudden now it's all triggering like mad. And um, fortunately for me, this little piece that I wore at my waist here had four little thumb wheels on it that I could adjust the sensitivity. And so I had to adjust it way down until I really learned how to play that instrument. And the learning how to play that instrument is really was about, and, and this is true, I think, of any gesture controlled instrument, these ones as well. It's really about learning how to be really still in your body. And by still, I don't mean no movement. I mean, being able to say that, <laughs> so I'm, now I'm triggering things. Um, being able to say that I, I want to trigger a bell sound, but I don't want to do it down here. I want to reach up here as if there's a bell hanging. And I want to reach up here and trigger the bell sound. So what I had to do was learn how to raise my arm up to here while keeping these muscles really quiet. And then trigger the bell sound, right? And so there's an interesting thing that happened to me when I started using these gesture control instruments. And that is that the... My, the quality of my movement in performance completely changed from using these instruments. Um, that instrument, that first one I had, the body synth, was so sensitive to the electricity from the muscles that if I turned the sensitivity all the way up, I could trigger a sound by just thinking about moving my hand. And I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. When you think about moving your hand, what happens is your brain sends an electrical impulse to that muscle to prepare it to move. And that's enough for that instrument to sense that and, and trigger a sound. So I could literally like just think about moving my hand and it would make a sound. And so what I had to learn how to do and what I found over the years using that instrument was slowly but surely I was able to turn the, um, the sensitivity up because I was able to learn to be more still in my body and when I did gestures, be very deliberate and do them you know, trigger that sound when I wanted to and not just because I happened to be reaching my arm, you know. Um, so that was a really interesting experience for me to learn to play that instrument. And and as a side effect, as I mentioned, if you look, if I look at really old video of myself, and I don't have any of this video posted online, <laughs> but if I look at really old video of myself when I first started doing works for voice and electronics, and it was just my processing and my voice, and I wasn't using a gesture controller yet. I still had gestures. So gesture gesture is very important to me. And I think a lot of people who are singers will agree that it, there's something about the physical gesture that's connected to tone production and to, you know, so, so, and also just for me, just as a performance artist, 
uh, the gesture was very important. And so I was doing gestures from the very beginning, even though they weren't triggering anything. However, when I look at those old videos, the quality of my movement, it was so stiff and kind of robotic and almost like very dated and kind of new wave or I don't know, like David burn or something, you know, very uh, sort of stiff physical motions that I was doing. And then I look at video of myself a few years later after I had been using this gesture controller and the quality of my movement is completely different. And it's, and it's not because I studied movement and tried to learn to change the, the visual quality of my movement. It's because I learned how to play these instruments and they require just, they they require a kind of deliberate a deliberate quality to the motion that made it really different. For example, if you look at your arm, if you just roll up your sleeve and look at your own arm, and you if you let's say you flex your hand way back like this, you can see there's a big muscle here that moves. And if you flex it this way, a different m muscle moves. And if you do it with one big motion, or say you make a big fist and squeeze your fist, you'll see this great big old muscle going like that, right? Um, so that's kind of like big motion or no motion, you know, and uh, it's, it's really hard to control anything other than a switch with that sort of harsh of a motion. What I learned was if you move individual fingers and look at your own arm when you do that, you'll see that the same muscles are activated, but in a much smaller way, which means you have much more finer tuning. So you could say like have a chromatic scale in this hand. And by moving your fingers, you could get more and more or less and less and a little l less space in between like the amount of movement. Uh, whereas if you're just doing this or let's say this, this device here, if I'm just doing this, it's, it's, it's very hard to get to be precise with that. It's very <laughs> hard to be precise with that. But if I am just using my fingers, then I have much finer control. And so it's kind of true with any instrument you play. I mean, if there's anybody who's a concert pianist in, in this group, you know, even just playing the piano, there's a difference in how, how, much, how much subtlety that you can get in like the velocity of, of your playing, um, the, the, you know, the, the dynamics of your playing um, by the different types of, mo of motion, different quality of motion. So, um, so using these gesture control instruments has actually really transformed visually what it looks like when I perform because of what it's required to play them. Um, and, and like I said, that followed through from that instrument where I, that I was wearing that was measuring my muscles all the way through to these instruments that I'm not wearing um, that are just looking for how close I am, or this one's looking for mass, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was my first gesture control instrument. And then um, it's after that, I, I, I started, I was still at that point using these hardware digital delays, and then I had this, this one gesture control instrument, which I would send the MIDI information from that to a sampler. So all I was using it for was playing samples. Um, and then like I said, when it got to be, so I started using the, the, the body synth in I think around 92. So that means I had already been doing voice and electronics, um, stuff for, I don't know, six, six, seven years at that point. Then, um, towards the end of the nineties, I had a artist residency in Japan and I was in Tokyo and I was traveling and carrying this gigantic, I, I was carrying a six space rack everywhere I went. And it was one of these SKB racks that you can clamp the front and the back onto it. And so then you had all this gear inside and then all the, all this black spaghetti sort of stuffed into the back of it. And then I was carrying like a big old Mackie mixer about this big, the same footprint as the top of the rack and in a different, in a different case. And, um, and then all the little stuff, the microphone, uh, my, 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 the body synth and all of its parts and all of that stuff was all packed, you know, in my suitcase in between the underwear and, the, you know, <laughs> so I was like carrying this incredibly heavy load every time I traveled and I was being charged hundreds of dollars in overweight luggage fees every time. So finally I was in Japan in 99 and I had a lot of friends that were using Macs 
And they were trying to encourage me to use Macs. But up until later in the 90s, there was no MSP. Now, I know some of you know what that means and some of you don't. But um, the MSP part of Macs is Macs signal processing. And before they added MSP, Macs was not about signal processing. It was really only uh, like you could do sequencing. You could do synthesis. There were a lot of things you could do, but signal processing was not one of them. So I was completely uninterested in Macs because I wasn't sequencing. I wasn't using MIDI in any way except to play sounds. Um, and so I, I didn't really see the point of having Macs. But then they added MSP. And then I was like, okay, now you're talking. Because I my work was all about signal processing. That was kind of like the core of what I was doing with signal processing. So as soon as they added signal processing, I wanted to use Mac. So the other thing, I was in Japan doing this residency, and I had a gig in New Zealand, and I had to fly to New Zealand. And uh, on the way there, they, they charged me some huge amount for my heavy thing. Then the plane stopped over in Korea, and then they made us recheck it and they charged me again and then I was like okay that's it I'm learning max and I'm porting all and by this time we people start we were having laptops and I had I mean even though the laptops like were weighed as much as a brick at that point um I I was like I'm gonna I had a power book and I, I'm gonna put my all my all this stuff that's in this rack is gonna go into the power book so I had a couple of really good uh friends that were like great Max geeks. And they helped me figure out how to program basically all the functions of all the hardware that I was doing and move that into Max MSP. And it took about, I would say, four or five years to really get everything that I was doing in hardware into the computer. But in that four or five years, I went from carrying this gigantic heavy thing with all these different moving pieces to carrying a laptop, albeit a heavier one than this, but still a laptop. And the laptop had all of those, all of the digital delay lines I built into my patch. And um, those were all, um, and if you could see my patch, I, again, I'm not hooked up to the video, but if you could see my patch, it's really, <laughs> um, it's, it still is an echo of my old rack. And as a matter of fact, I have these digital delay lines in my patch that are stacked on top of each other and I've named them after the delays that they replaced. And so there's one called Digi and that's the, that was the Digitech delay. There's one called Lexi, which was my lexicon delay. And I have one in here called Iban, which was my Ibanez delay. And they're all stacked up in here in the same order that they were in my old physical rack. So in a weird sense, today, this many years later, I'm still using basically the same gear that I was using then. And then the next thing that came after moving everything into Max MSP was figuring out how I could still physically control it because I'm very much about being present with the audience and being out here and not like staring at a computer screen and stroking a trackpad, you know, while I'm trying to perform. Um, and, you know, that whole thing of, Try where's the, where's the cursor? Trying to find, you know, you're in the middle of singing and like, where's the cursor? No, I, I it's like I'm not doing that. Um, so I, again, I went to my Max Geek friends and I said, you need to help me figure out a way that I can build things that will allow me to have the same physical control over this these devices now that they're in Max as I had when they were in hardware. So my hardware delays. For every one of them, I had this whole system that I had built up. Every one of those delays in my rack, I had a pair of physical foot switches that had a cord that went to the back of that delay unit. And so for each delay, there was a, a, a foot switch for opening the delay and closing the delay. Um, and then there was another one that was for, you know, there was, so there was, a, there was a open, a open and close the hold function. And then another one that was bypass the delay or not bypass the delay. There was two two foot switches for each one. So I have this wonderful uh, friend and collaborator in San Francisco. Um, uh, he's, he's, my, he's my performance, music performance husband kind of. <laughs> 
he and I have been like partners and sort of art partners and many kinds of partners for a long time. Um, but he was one of the people who in the early days was like, you should use Max. And I was like, I'm not using Max. And then it was like, Max MSP. Yes, I'll use Max. Um, so I went to him because he was building himself some beautiful little interfaces that were for performing. And they were all like sort of gesture control things. He had these things with bend sensors in them and all these different kinds of sensors he was making. Um, and and um, I said, I want you to build for me um, a set of uh, something that has quarter inch jacks on it that I can plug my foot switches into and I can send a bang to Max. And so he set about figuring it out and he did it and he built me this beautiful thing which I don't have I didn't bring them on this trip but they it looks kind of like these guys it's sort of flexy and it has a board in the middle that he that he designed um, and then there's all these quarter inch jacks and I could literally plug the exact same foot switches that I had been using with the hardware into those and program it to send a bang to max and so then I could open and close my delays with foot switches like I was doing with the, with the, with the rack mountable ones. Uh, then I said, I have this Mackie mixer and I don't want to carry this big mixer around anymore. However, I want to be able to move faders. So I want you to build me a bank of faders that I can send numbers to Max so that I can do that. And so he built for me a beautiful little fader box, also with this sort of clear plexi kind of like this. And actually, if you go to my website, which is PamelaZ.com, and you click the tech requirements link, or I don't, it's, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's tech requirements, or it might be say tech writer or something like that. The, there's a picture of the faders on the on that page, so you can see them. And um, so I, so for a, for quite a while, I was carrying the, that little pedal uh, box and the fader box that he made me, which allowed me to basically have the exact same physical environment that I had been working with the hardware, but I was now controlling Max. And I was moving faders up and down in my Max patch instead of moving levels on the, on the, on the um, Mackie mixer. Um, and so then, uh, by this time, I, I was already using the body synth, right? I had been using the body synth for a long time. And, I, uh, and, and so then my friend Donald built me this beautiful little guy right here. And yes? Thank you. Oh, I haven't even paid attention to the time. My goodness. I better, I better wa wrap up. Um, that I'm just going to tell you very quickly, because I, 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 I get so verbose. I'm sorry. Um, this guy, this, this, this little piece here, is, is, um, it uses ultrasound. And so this is looking for mass. And, when I, and it works the same way that... Um, uh, echolocation works. So when bats fly through ca caves and they, they make that clicking sound and then they're hearing the clicking bouncing off the cave walls back to their ears and they know how far they are from the wall because of that, this thing works exactly the same way. It's sending out a sound, ultrasound, and then my hand is sending that ultrasound back to it. And actually, this isn't going to work for Trondheim, but if we get really quiet, I'm going to point this at you and I think you will hear it even it's very directional. So even across the room, listen very carefully. Do you hear it? I see some heads nodding yes, some of the, it's very directional, so I have to point it kind of I have to point it kind of right, right at you. And it won't work if I point it at you, sadly. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's making you so you can hear this kind of buzzing sound. That's the ultrasound. And my hand is causing that to to bounce back at the other sensor so that it's hearing it. So this is almost like a microphone and a speaker right here. Um, this one uses infrared and it's doing the same thing except it's doing it with light. It's shooting infrared up out of one of these little things and then when I put my hand there, it's shooting it back down at it and that's how it knows where my hands are. And then the other one I was using was, um, uses uh, accelerometer and gyro and magnetometer. So. This is kind of like uh, strapping your iPhone to your hand in a way. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to stop because I think we won't have any time for questions if I continue. So um, does anyone have questions on either side of this virtual window? Hello. Um, I wonder uh, where do you figure that your, in your instrument starts and where does it end? 
where does my instrument start and where does it end? Well, um, I'm not sure if I can completely wrap my head around the question, but I will say that I think of what I think of my instrument as being is the combination of my voice and all these electronics. And I feel like it's, it's kind of a big gangly instrument that's made of those things. So uh, when somebody lists me in a program and they want to say, know how to explain what it is I'm playing, if they just write Pamela Z vocalist, I'm like, that's not complete. Um, and then I had somebody else write Pamela Z electronics. And that's also not complete. So I, I do think of those things as being kind of one instrument that's combined. And I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> maybe, or maybe do you think maybe do you think it starts up here uh, and, in the in the or, mind? Maybe, or does it start in the the lungs or the mm. uh, vocal cords? And and, well, and does it end in the room or the? Uh, the speakers or the that you know mm. I think it's uh, it, I think you can if you just transfer that um, metaphor to any instrument it's kind of the same way mm -hmm. so if I were a cellist where does my instrument start and end if I were a cellist you know what I mean mm -hmm. so there's a lot that goes into that p making music with that instrument and it has to do with the bot the human body interfacing with this piece of wood and 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 horse hair and what and, and whatever else is there um, <laughs> you know so I, I think it's the same thing it's like um, the how you define an instrument can be a really really open-ended broad broad answer I guess <laughs> well just to follow with the same trend of questions uh, where, where do you find the boundary between instrument and composition Ah, that's really interesting uh, question. Well, I think of myself as a composer performer. And uh, so I know that a lot of people who are a lot of composers who are, let's say, more conventional composers, um, maybe the act of composing for them is something that happens in their mind and maybe with a pencil and paper or maybe at the piano keyboard and notation, pencil and paper or notation software. Um But for me, I do think that my composing does come a lot from my physical person because when I compose works for myself to perform, I start by actually playing. And then it, there's an improvisational process that is the beginnings of what I create. And then something comes out of me and sometimes it comes out whole cloth in five minutes. Five minutes later, I have a five minute piece and I hope I was recording so that I They now can learn it. Um, and other times it's more like I'm making little bits and fragments and figuring out how they work together and then the composing takes a longer time. But it also depends on who I'm composing for. If I'm composing for a chamber ensemble, which I sometimes do, then um, my process is a little bit different, but it still has to do with me playing the music in order to hear it. Um, so I guess maybe the short answer to that is that I do, I am somebody who, although I sometimes wake up with a, some a little fragment or melodic phrase or texture or something in my head before I've even produced it in the, in the, in the world, um, most of the time I really need to actually physically do it in order to hear, I have to physically play it somehow in order to hear things and, and begin to layer them and put them together. So... Yeah, also trying to please raise your hand if you have any questions over there. Or if some more questions here. I think this is my question. Big shy. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm wondering how how you um, since this this instrument can be very vast in sonic possibilities, how do you use them in collaboration with other musicians? Uh I think I use them the same way that anybody else would use their instrument in collaboration because uh, I think your ears have to be involved when you're collaborating with somebody else. You're, you're, I mean, when you're making music of any kind, your ears have to be involved. But I think a lot of, a lot of playing with other people involves listening and being tuned into whatever it is that they're doing so that um, you can figure out how to fit what you want to fit into, into what they're doing. And I think that... Um, 
you're you're keyed into something important when you say that possibilities are vast because I do find that when the possibilities are vast it can it can cause you to freeze up because you're like I don't know what to do there's so many things I could do uh, I almost need to place restrictions on myself in order to to make a decision sometimes <laughs> um but I I think the answer would be the same as it would be for just playing an acoustic instrument or anything else that when you're working with other other musicians you need to really be listening and thinking about what it is they're doing. Uh, and also, again, it depends how that collaboration is working. If it's improvisational, then it's really a lot about listening um, in real time to what's happening and leaving space and being uh, aware that way, uh, which you'll see some of that going on when I do my collaboration with uh, Tuna and um, and and Sten. Uh, but... Um, Sometimes I've composed works that are for my voice and electronics and a chamber ensemble, for example. And in that case, I'm making choices in the studio. And then I'm uh, uh, using notation software to actually put notes on the page of what I want them to play and when they'll play it so that it becomes very clear and how all of those parts fit together is worked out in the computer and in my studio before I even meet with those other musicians. But that's assuming that I'm the person who's composing everything if it's if it's more of a collaboration, then you have to be together in a room and you have to be working together and listening to each other and finding how to fit what you're doing into what they're doing. So Uh, I have a bit of a, probably a random question, but what are the other vocalists who use electronics who are inspiring to you or who are new or like what is the... Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. um, other vocalists who use in electronics that are inspiring to me. Um, well, uh, they're, uh, back in the day, I used to listen to Diamanda Galas. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Um, she was... I was... She was a lot. It, the interesting thing about that question is, I did not. I wasn't aware of a lot of vocalists using electronics at the time that I started doing it. So when I first started doing it, I was kind of the only one I knew. <laughs> but then um, people would start comparing me to other people, and I would say, "They'd say, oh, you must be influenced by so and so.'" And then I'd, "Oh, I must go out and listen to that person." <laughs> and so, like one person who I'm embarrassed to admit that I was not aware of. Uh, was was Meredith Monk. Now, she does not use electronics as a rule. I mean, she might put a little bit of reverb. She might have her sound engineer put a little bit of reverb. But outside of that, her, her, her work is really mostly acoustic. But there's something about the way that she works that has a connection to the way that I work. And that's why people kept com comparing me to her. So it was really funny. It was like people would come up to me after a concert and say, oh, you must listen to a lot of Meredith Monk. And I was like kind of embarrassed. Oh, I don't know who she is. And so <laughs> then I, I went and bought a record of hers. And I was like, oh, okay, I can see why they say that because she's using an ensemble of singers to kind of do the sort of thing that I'm doing with my own voice and electronics. Um, there's, uh, you know, Laurie Anderson, I think, at, for, at that time was, was doing a lot. Um, the three I can think of that at the time when I was first doing this that were sort of in my head, at least, um, were Laurie and, and um, Diamanda Goss and, and, um, and Meredith, who's not using electronics, but who I think was, you know, doing something interesting with vo vocalization and layers. Um, but I have to say that a lot of my inspiration comes from people who are not necessarily vocalist. Um, composers who are writing for in instrument, other non-vocal instruments. Um, like I was very influenced, I think, in the, in the 80s by the, some of the minimalist composers, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, uh, people like that. Um, but also people who aren't even musicians, like visual artist. I was very inspired by works of people like Sol LeWitt, um, Bill Viola, uh, and then people in experimental theater like Robert Wilson and uh, the Japanese uh, Buto company Sankai Juku and uh, the late uh, Pina Bausch and her Tanz Theater. Those kinds of things 
were as influential, if not more, to me than other musicians, I think. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that really creates a nice bridge to uh, the next session, I think, because on Monday you're going to talk about your mixed video works and, you know, this, this, uh, this big production that's about you being also a visual artist. And yeah, so we're really in the Bonham uh, network. So uh, thank you very much, Pamela, and, and we're really looking forward to see you again thank on you Monday. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because here and there, yes, in Trondheim and here, yeah, just, we just change roles, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much.